I call this meeting of Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let a record show that a quorum of members is present, that the meeting has duly been duly called, and the notice of and the notice of the meetings has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is six o'clock. Please join us in uh, Mr. Emmett as he gives us our invocation, and Mr. Sanders as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Father, we come tonight, we're asking for your wisdom and guidance. Help our words to be seasoned with grace and uh, let us move forward as a school district. We thank you for Dr. Null and his leadership, for Carrie, for her input and others, Father, that uh, are diligently working to help better and improve Conroe ISD. Father, we lift up the students in our district as well. Help them do well. They have uh, several be graduating here shortly, Father. Help them finish their course strong and do well in their graduation. We ask for all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we pledge the flags of our country and the great state of Texas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the United flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Moving on to item two, awards and recognitions. We have a special district, district recognition for the 2020 Texas Music Education Associators, Associations All State. Uh, Dr. Knoll. All right. Thank you. Um, each year we have the honor of recognizing our All State musicians, and uh, it comes at the perfect time, as uh, just this past week, uh, the Texas Music Educators Association held their annual convention in which all these students were a part of. And I will tell you, uh, I know that Dr. Horton may mention this, but uh, I have the honor of attending that um, most years because typically we have uh, a group that is invited to perform. And it's amazing. Uh, I think Bob had told me before, it's 20 to 30,000 people um, over a four day span attend this convention. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and then to see how well our students perform at this um, is, is something that we should all be proud of. And so tonight we're going to celebrate our all-state um, musicians. And to do that will be Dr. Bob Horton, our coordinator of fine arts. Good evening, Board of Trustees. As Dr. Noel said, my name is Bob Horton and I am the coordinator of fine arts. And on behalf of the over 300 fine arts teachers who impact the nearly 65,000 students of Conroe ISD, I want to thank you for your constant support of the arts. Conroe ISD is recognized at the state and national level as a leader in the arts, and this is largely due to your commitment to a well-rounded education, which includes high-quality arts experiences. Vice President Hubert, members of the board and Dr. Knoll, thank you for giving recognition to the 35 students named 2020 Texas Music Educators Association, or TMEA, All-State Musicians from Conroe ISD. Just a brief word of explanation. The All-State process is a competitive one that begins throughout the state in auditions hosted by 33 TMEA regions. Individual musicians perform selected music for a panel of judges who rank each instrument or voice part and from that ranking, a select group advances from region to area. At these eight area auditions, the highest ranking musicians qualify to perform in a Texas Music Educators Association All-State group. These All-State students participate in three days of rehearsals directed by nationally recognized conductors during the clinic and convention. Their performances this past Saturday for literally thousands of attendees bring this extraordinary event to a close. Over 1,700 students are selected through a statewide process that begins from over <clears throat> 72,000 students from around the state vying for the honor to perform with one of the all-state ensembles, one of the bands, orchestras, or choirs. And the top 2.5% of student musicians who initially audition become all-staters. 35 of these are from Conroe ISD. At this time, I would invite the students to come in and line up along the wall, and they'll come forward in just a moment as I call their name. <clears throat> but while they are lining up, I would like to take a moment to recognize their outstanding teachers who are here tonight to support these students and who have guided them through the process to become all-state musicians. 
There are several in the audience. I'll just call their names briefly, and um, hopefully they will be able to stand and you'll see who they are. Conroe High School Choir, Clay West, Emily Eisterhold, Oak Ridge mm -hmm. High School Choir, Elisa West and Thomas Kang, Oak Ridge Band, Gerald Dillard, Albert Vela, Ali Celia, Oak Ridge Orchestra, Mindy Florian. College Park Choir, Aaron Bodane and Kent Dorries. College Park Band, Jeff Goring, Teresa Martin, and Rob Savala. College Park Orchestra, Dr. Peter Kempter and Emmanuel Carraza. The Woodlands High School Choir, Patrick Newcomb, Melissa Newhouse, and Stephanie Cook. The Woodlands Band, Joni Perez, Andy Salmon, Kyle Whitty. The Woodlands Orchestra, Aaron Michelson, and Leah Gordon. And the Grand Oaks Band, Mike Flake, Brian Moran, and Rick Drury. Thank you, teachers. Our students, Alex Bass Hill, Dylan Boyder, Liam Bustos, Wyatt Cade. Travis Carlson, Gabriel Christensen, Ryan Como, Ryan Harding, Griffin Keene. Alexander Kahn's Henry Liu Jack Perkins Matthew Roberts Joshua Santana Haley Sinkek, Marcelo Vasquez, and Iman Zahab. Haley, would you hold up your certificate holder? Haley has a very special one because Haley has the distinction of being the very first all-state student from Grand Oaks High School. <laughs> Addison Cronin. Nicholas Devia. Riley Glaceman. Sydney Jennings, Brooke Layden, Landon Laney, Lizzie Marlowe, Lindsay Moynihan. Amanda Randall, Alexia Rivera, Grace Schecksneider, Nicholas Vizi, and Marin West. Also, for the first time in history, we have four All-State Orchestra students in Conroe ISD. Three of them were able to be here tonight. Chris Chan. <laughs> Ryan.
Riley Curran. And Dylan Mansfield. On behalf of the board, we just want to say how proud we are of all of you and how much we share in the celebration of this accomplishment. Um, this is something you can take with you for a lifetime. Um, I like to, to share every year, like this is my fourth year in a row, that I'm the one that gets to come up here from the board and present to the TMEA All-State Musicians. Um, and I get that honor because I myself am a graduate of Conroe ISD music programs. And it was in those band programs when I was in junior high and high school in this district that I learned things that have carried me through life. It was um, watching and, and learning under Ed Schutz at McCullough High School. Y'all don't even know that McCullough used to be a high school. Um, but he was the first one that actually gave me leadership opportunities in band. Um, and he was the one that inspired me to go on. I have never worked a day in my life as a musician or as a music educator, but I play music every day to this day. I've traveled the world. I've played for presidents of two countries just because someone in high school inspired me to do it. Um, and I looked up some quick statistics on this. Um, program, schools that have music programs have an average attendance that's 5% higher than st uh, schools that don't, and they have a graduation rate that is almost 20% higher than schools without music programs. That's because it, music makes you not just better musicians, but it makes you more creative, expands your spatial temporal learning capacity, and it makes you better, all well-rounded, all-around people. And that's what we're trying to produce in this district, is not just successful students, but successful citizens. So we want to thank you for your representation of our district, of your schools, of your families, of your friends, of your teachers, and your music programs. Congratulations. And if we could have our music teachers kind of get in line behind these guys, we'd like to shake your hands as well. So if you would come up and get in line behind these folks as they come through, we would appreciate that. All right, so y'all got to step out, step, step, step forward, step forward, step forward, step forward, step forward. Circle around this Follow this guy. Come on, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're the guy. Right, come on, you're the guy. Here we go. Follow him. Follow him. He doesn't hurt. Thank you very much. God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Moore, for those kind words, and congratulations once again to all of those that uh, participated in that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's excellent. We love to see our students excelling in the, in the arts and basically in anything that they, they shoot for, so we're grateful for that. Moving on to item 2B, citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, do we have anybody signed up? Yes, we have nine people signed up to speak. Very good. This next item on the agenda is public comments for those who have registered to address the board in accordance with the board policy BED. Everyone is reminded that this portion of the meeting is not the appropriate forum to bring complaints for which resolution is sought. Before complaints can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item, they must be addressed by uh, following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures. Also, please keep in mind that the board has an obligation to protect the confidentiality of information that could personally identify a student. The board cannot permit comments that include students' names or in any information that might identify a specific student. This prohibition does not apply if the person speaking is a student's parent or guardian or is over the age of 18 and speaks about him or herself. If an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's agenda, the board will defer its discussion of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For any subject that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make any decisions, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Each person is limited to mo no more than five minutes for their presentation. This will allow the board to hear from citizens as well as ensure that the board meets the board meeting runs efficiently as there are many important items on the board agenda that must be considered. Everyone in attendance is reminded to treat all speakers with respect regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the speaker's message. Any person who does not conduct him or herself accordingly will be asked to leave or will be escorted from the room. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person. Garth Geisbrecht. Anna and Eric Lonnie. Maybe they're taking pictures. <laughs> Nicole May. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board and Dr. Knoll. I'm here again to discuss dyslexia. Uh, perhaps you're saying to yourself, why is she here again? Or even groaning inwardly to yourself. I will admit at this point, even my presence makes me uncomfortable. But at the beginning of the school year, I set a goal and strategy for myself to show up and speak out for all struggling readers and dyslexics in our district, and this is the heart of the strategy. So is it working? I would say yes. We have had two parent meetings with members of the district and have begun discussing processes and quality of services. There is fruit to bear, hopefully sooner rather than later, to include a summer school option for dyslexic students and increasing dyslexia services from two hours a week to two and a half hours a week. The latter includes adding a team to identify dyslexics in the district, which frees up the dyslexia teachers to add the additional day of dyslexia services. We plan to reconvene in March to continue our deep dive discussions. I hope to discuss RTI, dyslexia screeners, HB3, dyslexia allotment, special education services for our population, and teacher training. We also <coughs> had the privilege of serving breakfast to our wonderful dyslexia team at their last team training. We appreciate the dyslexia staff and the members of the district that have met with us so very much. Our parent-led Facebook group now represents over 150 families. There is another parent-led dyslexia group, Brighter Education for Dyslexia, that has a distribution list of 200. Our groups exist to, to put important information in the hands of parents. We don't know what we don't know. We are also focused on putting a spotlight on dyslexia in our district to improve the quality of academic life for our population. Last, we hope to make dyslexia and special education a platform for the upcoming school board elections in November 2020. The HB3 dyslexia allotment is approximately $2 million this year. I have been told by two high-ranking members of the district as well as a board member that the stance of the district is that the district has gone above and beyond for dyslexics and therefore the HB3 dyslexia allotment will supplant $2 million of the current $2.8 million dyslexia budget. I respectfully 100% disagree with this thought process. First, we must define above and beyond for our dyslexic population. We are identifying dyslexics at a negative 15% margin. We are providing the literal bare minimum services. We adopted a new program this year for our dyslexic population because the evidence suggested our dyslexic students were not thriving after completing the previous dyslexia program. 
The new program, I might add, is not evidence-based and therefore our population <laughs> receiving services are test monkeys. Processes to monitor success do not appear to be in place. We need more, more quality services, more teacher training, more special education teacher training, more identified dyslexics, more resources for parents, more highly qualified dyslexia staff, for example, more CALTS, more parent information nights, more fidelity to implementation. The additional $2 million from HB3 will 100% improve the quality of academic life for our struggling readers that are dyslexic. Supplanting the current dyslexia budget with the HB3 dyslexia allotment is stealing from our struggling readers. Please keep all the money in place to help our kids succeed long term. Our work is not done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. May. Alexandria Moore. What was your name? Alexandria Moore. Alexandria Moore. Good evening. How are you guys doing tonight? My name is Alexandria. I currently have a son that is in third grade in this district. Um, he is a 504 student with special services for dyslexia. Our journey started when he was only in kindergarten. His reading was very behind. They recommended that he redo kindergarten. Um, we were in another school district in another town at the time. Um, I noticed that whenever he wrote and when I would work with him, he confused his D's, his B's, and his P's, etc. I requested that he be tested for dyslexia. They refused and they said that they didn't do that until third grade. Well, it was a battle. $10,000 later and my son had a repeat a grade, but he finally had the dyslexic diagnosis. I really don't feel that it should be this difficult for our children to get a proper education. After watching him struggle and some of the things that he struggles with, I believe I am undiagnosed dyslexic. It made it extremely difficult to pass tests, standardized tests, and it took me four attempts to get my undergrad. I still can't spell, <laughs> and I avoid test taking at all costs. Um, I moved to the Woodlands solely based on the school district's reputation. With my son's accommodations over the past few months, his handwriting and his reading have definitely improved, but it's still not enough. Um, and he's not where he needs to be. He's been tested and his IQ is above average intelligence and what I'd, I'd like to see him thrive more. He deserves to thrive more. But without tutoring and without extra help, I don't foresee this happening. Unfortunately, I'm not able to help him because I don't have those skills myself. Um, we are all, we're not on subsidized lunches and I don't get welfare. However, paying for a tutor is not going to happen in a single parent household with my income. I'm sure there are many others out there because there's one in five kids that are dyslexic that have this issue. We need more. Our children deserve to flourish and to be successful in life. And it starts with their basic education, which starts here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. D. Howell. Good evening. Good evening. I'm a member of the Gladys Elementary School community and I'm here to talk to you today about rezoning. The Gladys Elementary community has signed a petition that took about one week with 734 signatures. The petition says, CISD and the Attendance Boundary Committee has submitted three proposals for elementary zoning beginning in 2020-2021 school year. Two of the plans split Gladys Elementary students between Gladys and Colson Tuff. The removal of Gladys students would have to happen to allow for Jacobs Reserve, a community off of 1488, to attend Gladys as a neighborhood. Jacobs Reserve would like to keep their community together. Gladys would also like to keep their community together and our kids' school progression unchanged. With the proposed change, students would have gone to Mitchell Intermediate, will now no longer attend the intermediate school and will attend Colson Tuff, a K through sixth grade campus. It's a fundamental change in the education you've chosen for your child. We welcome new students to Glass Elementary and feel strongly that it should not be at the cost of our existing community. Goes on to say, if you believe the community of Glass Elementary should stay together and not be split, please sign our petition. So 734 signatures in a matter of about a week, you can probably take off about 40 to 50 of those with out of town addresses as I went through and looked at the addresses. Another thing with the school rezoning that I would like to bring up would be the wording on the bond FAQ that was released in November of 19. 
It said without bond funding for new schools, the contingency plan calls for rezoning against uh, across high school feeder zones. I proudly put the vote yes for the bond in my front yard. Now, I'm questioning it. On an article for Community Impact uh, regarding full day pre K <coughs> opening in 2020, Debbie Phillips, CISD assist Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Ed, said the rezoning in the Woodlands and College Park feeder zones will also help free up space for the pre-K program. If our bond and our words are not gonna mean anything, we should not release FAQs that say that we are, please vote yes for this bond so we do not have to rezone high school feeder zones and then come out a month later to do exactly that. Moving Jacobs Reserve from College Park feeder zone at Ride Elementary does put them into a Woodlands High School feeder zone pattern. Yes, they will go back to Collins, which is back in their feeder zone, but it is fundamentally moving zones. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Joseph White. Joseph White. Good evening, how are y'all? Uh, I uh, promise, ladies and gentlemen, I will not take five minutes. But I do apologize, I just came from work. Um, uh, Mayor Culpa, uh, honestly, I, I have a child, much like uh, Ms. Howell, um, that will be impacted by the zoning. Um, my child will, uh, uh, both my children, I should say, my, my youngest will attend third grade at Colson Tuff under the proposed uh, revision. Uh, my oldest will have the option of uh, staying at Mitchell for a sixth grade or moving to Colson Tuff. So in my situation, I feel pretty lucky. Um, both great schools, Colson Tuff, Gladys, I can't pick, right? They're great schools. And uh, uh, quite frankly, the principal at Colson Tuff, I've not met her, but she should be commended along with the principal at Gladys for the work that they have done uh, trying to ease the transition for these young children. Uh, obviously a, a very, uh, a potentially a traumatic situation. What my issue is, um, is more procedural. Uh, the stated objectives of the ABC of the committee uh, were number one, to solve uh, for the overcrowding for Ryden and Bush and number two, impact the least number of students possible. Very valid uh, objectives. So when you look at that, uh, and the current proposal, I believe they're estimated at 600 uh, children that will be impacted. The community um, uh, parents uh, have put together options that impacted significantly, significantly less numbers, uh, down to 200. Uh, when questioned about this, the answer was simply stated as, it didn't make it out of committee. Okay, so under the air of, uh, of TOMA, the open, uh, Texas Open Meetings Act, why? Why did it not make it out of committee? Um, I think that should be a, a, good, uh, a good, good question for the leaders, um, you the board, to ask the committee, what were those reasons? Why did these options not make it out? What was the clarification and justification? And additionally, why of the three options presented to the community, were two of them virtually identical? Um, that's just something as, as um, a leader in my profession, if someone presented me uh, with options, I would ask, what were, your, uh, what were your reasons? What were your justifications? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Nolan. Thank you for participating in this process this evening and for your willingness to listen. Uh, my name is Michelle Nolan and I've been a member of this community since 1978. I am a product of CISD and a graduate of McCullough High School. I am speaking tonight as a parent of three children who attend schools in CISD. Human nature is to resist change, yet we can all agree that change is inevitable. When applying this philosophy to our rezoning issue that we have tonight, Often, I'm hearing that people are participating and the conversation might be just the families that feel like this only impacts my school. Or people aren't participating because they say the rezoning doesn't impact their school at all. <laughs> I'm asking for the school board to look at the rezoning changes and how they impact CISD as a whole. Please ask yourselves if the current plan on the table that you will be voting on tonight is the best, chan is the best plan for the needed change. My fear, as well as many others in our community, is that it is not. And not only is it not the best plan, it is a very damaging plan to CISD as a whole. 
In any business, you should have short-term and long-term plans. The plan that the ABC committee has put before you tonight is a Band-Aid plan. It does not address the growing population off of 1488. This matter has gone on a very long time unchecked and ignored by the district. It appears that the community, it appears to the community that maybe the long-term plan is to continue to push neighborhood children further west out of their community schools in order to accommodate the growth off of 1488. This fails to keep intact the community school philosophy. The school board should be, and the community is, demanding to know what the long-term plan is for the growing and current 1488 communities, because they are the impetus for which has brought about the need for rezoning. I ask you to consider how the plan before you tonight could be the best solution when it includes creating another split campus feeder school. We have one split feeder campus now at Powell Elementary, and I have heard from many parents over the years the impact that this has on their children when it comes to, to intermediate school and beyond. I would like the board to consider what I know is a top priority for the district, which is the mental health of our children that begins with building relationships at the elementary school level that they can continue to foster into intermediate, junior high, and high school. This can only be accomplished by putting the philosophy of community schools as a top priority. Our schools build community. With all elementary feeders to College Park full, we need to address the issues there. We need to create a plan for these neighborhoods off of 1488 to have their own elementary and intermediate schools so that a splits feeder is not the only option. It is clearly not the best option. It has been mentioned that transportation for the areas off of 1488 is difficult, long, and tedious. Concerns for safety have been mentioned. This leads me to question why the district continues to avoid the solution to transportation, overcrowding, and split feeder schools by building community schools off of 1488. I ask for you to vote down the plan before you tonight because it is just another plan that fragments our community and I request that a plan that better serves the children of CISD be presented. Thank you. Thank you. John Nix. Howdy, Sell the same thing I like to discuss as like I do in almost everything. I'd like to see, you know, the policy change for deliveries to be at the, where, you know, delivery apps can be, as a delivery driver can deliver to the, to the different schools. It's prohibited in the handbook that's given to the students, and I'd like to see that changed. Another thing I'd like to see changed is the Wi-Fi to where we can assess Facebook on the CSD Wi-Fi. And, of course, everyone knows my comments on the element. Thanks so much, and have a great day, and God bless Texas. Thank you. Carrie Freemeyer. <laughs> Darn. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you, Dr. Null, uh, members of the bo uh, school board. Thank you so much for our retention stipend that we received just February 15th. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. And um, on behalf of um, all teachers and educational uh, staff, uh, we thank you very much for looking into it, doing the research on it, and making it an across-the-board uh, kind of stipend for all to receive. Um, thank you for all your work, and I just want to say I'm hoping to see this stipend again next year. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's it. That's it. <clears throat> <clears throat> and on that note, <laughs> very good. Thank you for those who participated. Moving on to item three, the consent. Excuse me. Did we we did call some names a while ago? We, we could go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. What time? It doesn't matter. We didn't get it, so. 
Let him speak. Go ahead and let him speak. Let him speak. Yeah. Absolutely. Ma'am, you first, you second. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. President, is that okay? Absolutely, yes, sir. Yeah, let's settle this. Vice President, by the way. I was waiting patiently. Vice I President, thought, okay, what? you'll get to me. <laughs> Did you sign up after 3 p.m.? No, it was uh, Sunday. Okay. Um, my name is Anne Marie Kennedy, and I have a daughter getting ready to graduate. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> it's going to take a, vis a village, of course. I'm here again to address the statements Dale Inman has made. Um, publicly regarding GLBT people in general and in relationship to him being concerned about conservative Christians and GLBT people coexisting. He does not support all being welcome. This has been the closest feigned attempt at making an apology to those he has offended and said um, that he will not defend those in Conroe ISD. And on the website, it says all means all, and I'd like it to be across the board, pun intended. This is a sermon from Reverend Sean Coons. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Again, that's the closest that has been brought forth by Dale Enman to apologize to those he has offended. It sounds okay on first read. How can it be bad? to love anybody. And it doesn't sound really Christ-like to love sinners, right? And we shouldn't hate sin, especially if we think of sin as things that we do to hurt ourselves, others, or hurt God. The phrase is not in the Bible, though. It is thought to have originated from St. Augustine several hundred years after Jesus. And in one of his letters, he called for early Christians to have a love for mankind and hatred of sins. Over the ages, this saying has appeared in various forms, but they all mean basically the same thing. If we know of someone who is sinning, we should continue to love them as a sinner, but hate and condemn the sinful actions they do. And this does sound right, true, right? Never stop loving someone no matter what horrible things they've done. And here's the catch. Rarely are we ever able to contain our hatred only to the sin. Gandhi once said, and once spoke about this saying, hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy enough to understand, is rarely practiced. And this is why the poison of hatred spreads to the world. Love the sinner, hate the sin. If we practice this, we end up focusing much more on sin and the label of sinner, much more than we focus on love. It's February, we're supposed to love. Jesus said, love the sinner. Jesus said, love your neighbor. Never said, love the sinner. Jesus said, love your neighbor. Jesus knew that if he commanded people to love the sinner, they would begin looking for people more as sinners than as neighbors. Think about it. If I said to you right here and now, I want you to love everyone sitting in this board meeting today, especially those who have recently been diagnosed with a highly contagious form, coronavirus. Are you going to focus on loving your neighbor or are you gonna look for those who look a little under the weather? So, when you love the sinner and hate the sin, it doesn't lead us to love. Instead, it leads us to immediately to a place of judging, which is a sinner, and which sins are they guilty of. Love the sinner, hate the sin is often used as a code for saying, I judge you, you are a sinner, you should be ashamed that you do what have you. But even though I am better than you, I will love you anyway. That patronizing doesn't cut it. And here's the deal, Dale. Your statements breed hate and intolerance and do not reflect the values and mission statements of the Connor ISD or the student body, which shows we are all better off working together, <laughs> making the world a safer and kinder place. And you can't say you are able to support all the students of Conroe ISD, and you have made it clear there is a sizable portion of the student body you are against. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Mm -hmm.
the Sorry, we missed your name. Can I get your name? Yeah, it's Becky Barton. Barton. Mm -hmm. um, I am a parent of Gladys, and I'm speaking as a parent of four children who have attended or currently attend Conroe ISD schools. I want to speak as to the impact to the families <coughs> that the rezoning proposal has. We, I have lived here and attended Conroe ISD school since 2008. My eldest child was a second grader at Galatas School. And my youngest child still is at Galatas School. I, it's been often said that because of the rezoning and it's been several years that there isn't the same families being impacted. And I'm here to tell you, yes, we are the same families and we are being impacted. I would like to point out that along the Flint Ridge area, which is 92F, this is the fourth rezone in 20 years. When the houses were built in 2000, they were zoned to Galatas. When Tuff opened, they got moved to there, and then they got moved back to Galatas in 2009. And now in 2020, you're proposing a fourth move for families to endure to change schools yet again. And in addition, would you buy a house in such a swing zone that has such a target on it from the local school district? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I also signed up to speak online. I apologize. Okay. That's okay. Well, you have five minutes, so I just want you to know. <laughs> what is your name? It's Rachel Walker. Good evening, board. Good evening, Dr. Null. Thank you again um, for giving us the time to speak, even though our names didn't show up. Um, I want to start with a really brief story uh, about something that happened to me this week. Um, uh, you'll see how it's relevant. Um, I was out running errands, and um, I have a sticker on the back of my car. It's an HRC sticker. If you don't know what HRC is, it's the Human Rights Campaign. It's just a little blue square with a yellow equal sign on it. I don't get a lot of attention for it, but it's on my car. Um, unfortunately, I came out um, of the store to find somebody had thrown coffee on my car and wrote a very derogatory, um, I won't repeat the word, but it's a very derogatory term used to describe LGBTQ people sometimes. Um, fortunately, I have a lot of privilege. Um, I'm white, I'm cisgendered, I'm Christian, and I'm straight. And so I was able to take a baby wipe and wipe that you know, ugly word off my car and move on with my day. However, I have some friends that that kind of thing happens to a lot. And unfortunately, they carry that with them throughout their day because it happens all too often. Um, so I'm here to speak again, Mr. Inman, I'm so sorry. I'm here to speak with respect to you. Um, but once again, we haven't seen an apology. Um, the last thing I saw on your Facebook was, was comparing the LGBTQ community to pedophiles. Um, these kind of things aren't okay, and I'm going to urge you respectfully one more time to please apologize. People are hurting. Um, the thing is, and maybe other people notice it too, but I've noticed it, um, it seems like possibly you might be using this position on the school board to maybe further other political aspirations and that's your decision, but you're doing it on the backs of your colleagues, on the backs of administrators, on the backs of teachers, and on the backs of students. You're here to represent all students. And if you cannot represent all students, then I'm gonna urge you respectfully to resign. So, thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Thank you. Is there any, anyone else that we missed? Okay, thank you. Hearing, yeah. hearing none. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, now moving on to item three, the consent agenda. And I uh, have not heard anybody wanting to remove anything. Is that fair to assume? Move approval, consent agenda is presented. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? Very good. Thank you. All right, item 4A, consider approval of attendance zone for elementary and intermediate schools in the Woodlands and College Parks, Dr. Noll. All right, Dr. Chris Hines. Good evening, 
Vice President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Tonight, I am here to bring forward to you the recommendation from our attendance boundary committee um, that we've been working on to provide some relief, uh, primarily at Ride. We've talked about some of the areas in the last couple of months, just kind of give you an update. Um, why is it necessary to, to do the rezoning? We know our most common reason we do this is when we build new schools. This is not the case um, here. This is one of these situations where we're trying to basically shift students to take advantage of uh, classroom space um, where we need it. Why is this process challenging? It is challenging for so many reasons, um, and you've heard many tonight. Uh, school, schools are communities, neighborhoods are communities, families often have a history of attending particular schools, they often choose where they live to attend particular schools, and the schools or uh, locations are not always where we need them. One of the themes that, that we certainly as a district have to deal with is our, been our growth. Um, February 13th, our enrollment was 64,959 students, and this is an increase of over 2,250 students se since September 6, 2018, which is near the beginning of last school year. So we continue to grow. In addition, the transition to full-day pre-kindergarten classes next year means that essentially we will be growing by approximately 750 pre-kindergarten students um, because we currently serve 90% in half-day settings. So, that growth is in addition to our normal or approximate 1,400 student growth. Campus capacity, we talk about this. It's always good to kind of refresh on this. Um, that's a moving target. Campus enrollment, we know, increases or decreases over time. Campus capacity can fluctuate a great deal depending on class size or special programs. Because space is in such demand throughout the district, I always want to stress that even when a building is below its target enrollment capacity, the space is generally being used. Uh, we use it for things such as special programs or offices for itinerant staff, small group instruction or storage, but we use all of our space. Portable classrooms, and this is not our preferred method, have, have been a way for us to uh, manage fluctuating growth and to reduce the need to constantly adjust our attendance boundaries. So we've tried to use these from time to time. Um, just to, probably the most recent example I think of is when, um, before we opened Clark Intermediate, Cox uh, was probably almost 150% its capacity. Um, and then we, we split. For safety reasons, though, we have been trying to reduce our reliance on the use of portable classrooms. And recently, we reduced our target for <clears throat> maximum capacity limits from 120% to 110%. And I think over time, we're going to want to continue to reduce that further. We currently have 179 portable classrooms in use around the district. So why are we beginning this rezoning process? Well, we have, the, the short answer is we have some crowded schools. Most of those are in the College Park feeder. We have some schools that have some room. Uh, Ride is currently has 757 active students, has a capacity of around 575. It utilizes 12 portable classrooms, so roughly running 132%. Lamar is currently with enrollment of 789 students, utilizes six portable classrooms. It's roughly at 109% of its capacity. Glenlock with 628 students, is approximately at 109% of its capacity, utilizing six portable classrooms. And Glenlock is a, a split elementary also. Uh, Powell Elementary, which is another split elementary, currently has an enrollment of 869 students and is roughly at 105% of its capacity, um, utilizing three portable classrooms. And Bush, which is currently at 97% of its capacity with an enrollment of 801 students, um, but it's projected to uh, grow to 136% its capacity by 2025 due to growth along that 1488 corridor, which includes um, Foster's Ridge and River's Edge. Uh, since November, Bush has added roughly 20 students. So where are the campuses that have some capacity? Currently, Derrichin is approximately 75% capacity with an enrollment of 849 students. Gladys is approximately at 74% capacity with enrollment of 606 students. Tuff is approximately at 77% its capacity with enrollment of 867 students. And Buckaloo is at approximately 90% its capacity with enrollment of 694 students. 
put a little chart together to kind of illustrate um, where our challenges are, uh, where we have potential space, also where we serve um, students in pre-K and where we stu serve students in our bilingual programs. And, and I share the pre-K and bilingual because those certainly become uh, programs that we can look at um, as a part of or as a result of whatever we approve um, with the zoning recommendation. So we, we set about the process with our committee uh, to have our campuses within 110% within of their capacity and Ride, as mentioned, is at 132%. Lamar and Glenlock are getting pretty close. Uh, we also wanted to plan for some of that growth that's coming in along the 1488 corridor and we also wanted to accommodate for our full day pre-K programs as we can. So to do that, we had a committee put together and they've been uh, an outstanding committee. I don't know if we have some committee members here tonight. If you raise your hand, thank you very much for serving. They've been, uh, they've done an outstanding job. And really what is a very difficult uh, and challenging process, as I mentioned, it's never easy to talk about uh, changing boundaries because it impacts families and everybody on that committee understands that. Um, so the process, we look at goals, um, to use as a guide during this process, and these are not in a particular order, but we want to be mindful of that, <clears throat> that we're providing an education for our students, and that is our mission. So our, our kids are precious to us, and we want to make sure we do uh, the best we can to serve our students. We want to draw boundaries and support efficient, effective use of our facilities and resources. We do want to be fiscally responsible. We want to plan for future growth. We want to induce, reduce enrollment at overcrowded campuses. We want to communicate information. We want to develop proposed attend attendance boundary scenarios. And we have several considerations. And again, we've shared these with you in the past, but campus capacity, input, demographic factors, proximity, neighborhoods, when we've rezoned in the past, possible location of future schools, future enrollment, transportation patterns, all these things are things that are looked at. So the committee began by developing several scenarios in uh, late November. Um, really we met with kind of an orientation and we shortly thereafter started developing scenarios and um, and also started receiving online feedback from community members and our uh, committee members also developed several scenarios. We looked at the scenarios, uh, narrowed down to three that were shared. Uh, we received lots of comments, uh, over 800. Uh, the committee uh, then went back uh, and started meeting again and looked at those three scenarios. They developed 13 variations of those three scenarios as well as some totally new ones uh, we brought forward. Um, really looking at trying to rethink and relook at it. Um, and all our committee met at least eight times. We looked at more than 40 proposals um, throughout this process. There were three rounds of kind of this process. One was, uh, hey, this is what we're doing. We're looking at it. The second round was showing what we've come up with. And then the third round, and then going back and tweaking that and working on it some more. And then the third round was uh, just recently where we've shared what we've come up with. I always have to just generally remind you about geocoding. Uh, for planning purposes, we use, when you see real numbers, when I shared enrollment earlier, those are who's enrolled today, real students in a school. Um, when we do planning, we use geocoded, meaning who lives within an attendance boundary. Um, and we do that because that's really the, the one thing we know that is there. Uh, we can move programs around. Um, transfers may vary from year to year and from school to school. Most common reasons that we see for uh, transfers, uh, a teacher might bring their children to school with them or a nearby school will have their uh, children go to that campus. So we brought forward three scenarios. Um, and we've shared um, kind of the outline of these previously with you. Scenario B um, had that area that is off Old Conroe Road um, going to Derrichin. And then uh, scenario C um, was a variation about uh, Tuff, where we had some students moving out of Tuff to Derrichin. Um, and, I'll, and I'll point out some of the main features uh, as we look at scenario 8.312, which is the committee recommendation. Um, in this committee recommendation, it has zone 75, which is all of Jacobs Reserve, which impacts 323 geocoded students that would go to uh, from Ride Elementary to the Lattice. Uh, it also impacts 73, which is the Lakeland, Northline Oaks area, which is currently in Lamar. 
as well as 87A, which is kind of a commercial area off Technology Forest. And these areas would move from Lamar to Ride. Uh, it also impacts um, 92F, um, Cascade Canyon, Shawnee Ridge. Um, that's over here. And this is an area that would go from Galatis to Tuff, as well as uh, H92, which is Ivana Sterling Ridge and Sterling Green. And that area also would move from Galatis to Tuff. Also included in this is um, 92A, which is the area west of Alden Bridge um, Drive. It's Eagle Mead and Acacia Park and Glen Aaron. This area currently goes to Bush and would move to Buckaloo uh, under this proposal. And then uh, certainly this is an area up here called 75J, which is going to be River's Edge. Uh, that currently has no students and there's no homes yet in this area, but we know it's coming. And under this presentation, under this recommendation, um, this would move uh, to Buckaloo as well. And it's certainly an area we want to keep an eye on. And all of this impacts 525 uh, K through fourth graders. It impacts 883 um, intermediate level students. The original uh, version A impacted 100 students more. Uh, and what changed, and I'll just kind of walk through a few of those changes. Uh, this is the, the intermediate version of that map. And you can see the impact on the intermediate is obviously when we move some students to K-6, it would impact their intermediate school. So some of the differences, based on the feedback, one of the things the committee went back and, and heard loud and clear is nobody wanted to move. And um, so that's a, a good problem. Um, people like their schools, they love their schools, they don't want to move, they, they, they love their school community. So I think the committee went back and looked and and tried to, to whittle that number down. Um, so the 92A was divided in an area that was west of Alden Bridge, would go to Buckaloo, and the area that was east of Alden Bridge or closer within that, certainly, certainly within walking distance uh, to Bush would stay at Bush. And that was also, um, I think, and it, and it continues to be one of the challenges, particularly in this particular case with Bush and Buckaloo are both very walkable schools. And um, these are uh, areas that we don't want to disrupt, and yet it's hard to not want a domino down. Uh, so it is one of the things that the committee struggled with, and there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, so 92 in um, would not be zoned to Buckaloo and remain at Bush. So it kind of the committee split that neighborhood. Another uh, area is Section 92J, and that's an area that was uh, originally plan to move to Tuff from Gladys, and it was um, it's not a large number of students, and so we felt like uh, we could fit in the Gladys, so we, re we left 92J. Uh, and then 92F, um, which is a large number of students, uh, committee looked at and wanted to reduce that number, and so we tried to, to create a smaller unit from that. So it was a rather large unit and tried to create a smaller unit, uh, so 92F. Was, is being zoned to Tough under this recommendation, 92O, which was the new part, uh, will remain at Gladys and Mitchell. So this reduced the impact by roughly 100 students. So under that recommended scenario, Bush decreases in size only by 29 students. Now we did move 75J, which is a future growth area, to Buckaloo. Buckaloo has limited capacity as um, we're approaching that 90% area. Um, Discussion was given to moving Lake Creek Forest, which is currently has 43 students uh, from Bush to either Buckaloo or Derichin. Um, we did not get a consensus on that, but that was certainly there was a lot of discussion as, as uh, a way to address Bush. Um, and that's probably one of the things that I think we all struggle with as a committee is with this recommendation, we know we've got more work to do with Bush. Um, it will overflow in the near future. And that's certainly an area that we'll have to address. Buckaloo increases by 29 students, uh, but it also gets the growth area of 75J. Um, and if we did look at moving Lake Creek Forest to Buckaloo, um, that is an area that we would probably want to look at moving somewhere else because it's not going to have, Buckaloo would probably not have room for both, both those areas. Gladys, uh, under this scenario, uh, increases by 177 students to near capacity. At 773, tough increases by roughly 220 
three students to 981. Lamar um, and Ride both decrease enrollment. Lamar by just a little bit, Ride by roughly uh, 300 students. And Mitchell reduces by 77 students under uh, recommended scenario A 3.12. Uh, Darachin and Ride become available um, as possible options to look at meeting the demands of full-day pre-K or other programs that we want to look at. So the in total impact of geocoded students under this scenario was 608. <coughs> I want to just give you a quick overview of the demographics um, and of the campuses that are impacted by the movement. Uh, certainly Ride uh, demographics change the most, and that's simply the result of the shrinking size of the school um, and, and, and what remains. The possible, and I wanted to just point this out, this is just a, a draft or a possibility of one way um, we can use the space at Ride to try to address crowding at Glenlock, Lamar, and Powell. Um, and these are just some possibilities. This is under this scenario, um, a pre-K solution is, um, is explored and um, in this option, for example, Ride might receive roughly 100 pre-K students, which would put it right at 100% capacity. And this is based on uh, real numbers projection, not geocoded projections. So I wanted to adjust this. So this is, this is us going back and looking at, okay, how many transfers we think will be there. Um, how many students we actually think will physically be on that campus once we go through this process. So this is for next year, looking at a 2021 year, but you can see Buckaloo uh, would go over 90%, Bush would creep up on 100%, uh, Glenlock, uh, if we moved pre-K from Glenlock, we could get back to 100%. Um, Haley, under this plan, we would not address Lamar. Um, we would look at moving pre-K, could get to 101%, down from 109, Powell uh, to 100%, uh, and Ride would go from 132% to 100%. So that's just one option. Another option that certainly we can look at is uh, bilingual. Both of those <coughs> impact uh, similar numbers of students. Um, under this option, we show Derrickson picking up a pre-K program as well as a pre-K bilingual program. Uh, which would increase its enrollment and move it closer to 80% capacity. And, and really, once, once we do this, um, a really only amount of space that, that's going to be left is going to be at Derrickson. And, and even that's going to be a finite amount um, if we fill it up, if we see a big increase in pre-K participation because of all-day program. It's something we'll have to keep in mind. This is just an example of how we might impact the numbers uh, based on space that becomes available at Ride. So we, we've had an outstanding committee that wrestled with many issues. Um, they did give a great deal of time and effort to this process. They understand the significance of this process. Um, and although this plan may not be as comprehensive as we hoped, it does provide possible relief to several campuses through program options and it sets out some logical next steps to address our future needs at Bush. So we feel like this is an option that solves for now, um, but also gives us the ability to take some further steps to solve um, for what is quickly approaching. And if approved, our staff will begin this process of welcoming our new students and making transition plans. And um, I want to say thank you for um, pre presenting that. And I also want to say thank you to our committee for their hard work. And I want to answer any questions that you may have. We need a motion first. Yes, sir. I'm, I make the motion, but I have questions. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second, but I have questions too. We have a second. Our motion is second. It's open for discussion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rosens. Okay. Um, and I, I know some of the answers to these, or I think I know some of the answers to these, so I hope you'll pardon me because I know how much hard work you've put into this. I know how nice a person you are, and I know how understanding you try to be, okay? But somebody's got to make a decision, okay? And that happens to be not you. That's us. But, uh, you know, you have to come up with a, with a recommendation. So, first of all, I mean, a couple of things, you know, you mentioned a while ago, <laughs> well, Buckaloo and, and Bush were, were built, I mean, they were built when they were needed, where they were needed. And 
communities turn over and they turn over. And I happen to be, I think, the only one on the board the last time we did this. And for whoever mentioned that we moved you then from Gladys, I was responsible for that one too. And, and everybody was okay after because they are all above excellent elementaries and schools and neighborhoods and everything. But the issues that I see here are number one, well, let me let me back up. Did you let everybody express their opinion? I believe so. Well, I mean, opinion. you know, everybody that chose to come, yes. right? Right. I mean you didn't didn't cut anybody off. You did not listen to them. If they brought a proposal and I heard earlier that there was a proposal that only affected two hundred kids. But those two hundred kids might be traveling across the district. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying what that proposal was because I didn't see it. But I, I you know, I, I saw one of the proposals that ran the kids all the way around the Horn to Derchy, uh from from 1488, and you know, every kid all means all. Every kid counts, and those bus times and those cost of transportation and so on and so forth, as well as, you know, we just got through the bond, and I had people. I don't think they were telling it. Well, I know they weren't telling the truth. Saying we had all this extra capacity in the district. Well, where is it? Okay, where is it? Because I see in the scenario about three pages back here, where I see a hundred to a hundred and one percent across the board. So I'd like them to tell me where that capacity is. And you have one neighborhood that doesn't have a child in it yet, but you know, good and well, it's coming. All that said, okay. I know somebody's got to, if you consider having to move schools, somebody loses and somebody wins. Or you could say everybody's a winner because they're all fantastic schools. It's just a matter of how you look at change. But I do have one question. If this is, you know, you, you said something to me last board meeting. If we made a move that lasted 10 years like we did last time, it was a good move. What I hear you saying tonight is not a chance. <laughs> I mean, we're at 100% capacity right now. And, and of course, neighborhoods in the woodlands are acting differently. Than, they're not just all in dead growth, okay? But they're, they're changing. And so but I understand we have to fill our capacity, okay? And that's why I lean for this. But I also am reluctant to make a move that's going to turn around and get changed three years from now and affect the very same people that you're, I mean, you know, you, you, you mo I think it was Lake Creek. I'm, I'm going from memory here. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to stay with you on the slides, sure. but there's a lot of slides there. But at Lake Creek, the, the one that has zero capacity, is it? No, that, that's Lake Creek River's Edge. Edge. River's Edge. Okay. What I'm saying is, then you're saying, well, we don't have room for it. So what is it? it are they going to have to be bused all the way around to Uh My point is, you know, we have to blend financial reality and filling our capacity as far as buildings are concerned with building an elementary in Jacobs Reserve or however you want to say that, or on 1488, okay? But is there a way that we can look at, at preschool and, and program and taking those out of the schools and reducing the impact of this? Only you can answer that. I, I cannot make the math work from here if it is too many too many moving parts. But what I'm saying is you're you're placing the pre K in different schools and you're placing the programs in different schools. And sometimes speaking of geocoding, sometimes you're filling the school up arbitrarily. And um yeah, Glenlock's I'm, probably the best example of that Glenlock has less than five hundred geocoded students but but it's overcrowded. Well right. So I realize we have bond money, we have plans, we have, and you know, and please forgive me, Dr. Null, if I'm suggesting something that is not even in the cards, so to speak. But I don't believe a solution that we know is going to change within a couple of years, if that's anywhere near accurate, is really a solution. And I'm not saying that one of the other solutions is. I don't think we found the solution here. And I think it all comes down to there's finite resources with the bond. I, I understand that. But um, 
it won't be the first time we've moved schools around. It, you know, it, it won't be the first time that a priority has jumped and caused us to change what we're doing. And all I'm asking is, can you move pre-K, special programs, or whatever to keep from moving neighborhoods with with another location? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I do. And, and, and last but not least, um, I mean, would it solve the problem of moving people twice? And I'm talking about twice from today. Once, once being tonight, and then once being two, three, four, five years from now. Again, a couple of things. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. the the next The next big move in this area will come if and when we open a new school. So, if we if we open a campus, let's say we build a school in the 1488 corridor. It could be a K-6, it could be a K-4. When we do that, we will have to do some major rezoning because that will have an impact um, on all of our schools. Uh, using the example of, depending on the school, it may go half size. And so we, will, we, will, we would see a, a, a huge disruption. There's a couple things I will say about this scenario that's recommended to you. One, it is a scenario that the committee put a lot of thought into in terms of there are some logical next steps. We do not believe this is a scenario that you have to undo in two years. There may be the next step that you have to do. And we talked about one, 75J moving to Derrickson may be the next step. We, we didn't do it in this one, but we might do it still. Um, the, the, other, the other reality is kind of where our needs are and where our space is. And that's, that's not going to go away. So whether we're driving somebody around the long way or whether we're putting a pre-K student on a bus and driving them all the way across the woodlands, either way, our space is not going to be where our students are and where our programs are. And that's why, and as we start looking at this, one of the things that, and I can't speak for almost 40 people on the committee, because there was 40 different opinions on this, and I'll give you some of my thoughts on this. But that's what draws us to Ride and Gladys, because they're more central in location in this part of our and part of the school district. And so it's going it, to, it, it moves your eyes back there. Our crowding area falls along the 45 corridor, 242 corridor, and the 1488 corridors, right? These are areas that have seen growth. And so as our population uh, has increased, you can see where our crowding is. Haley, Linlock, Lamar, Ride, and Ride's from 1488. We can see where the future of bush crowding is going to come from, the 1488 corridor. And so it really becomes that issue of how do we move students to where we have some seats. And right now, where we have the seats are at those three schools. So I, I think it's, you know, the reality is, could we move some pre-K programs from Lamar and Glenlock? Um, instead of moving students out of Gladys, could we move those pre-K programs over to Tough? Yes, we could. It'd be a long ride, but we could. Um, would that solve for ride? Absolutely no. It will not solve for ride. And, and so then we're still going to be back at, well, what are we going to do uh, for ride? Could we, brought, could we brought, uh, move bilingual program out of Glenlock to Gladys, a little more centrally located? Ab absolutely we could. Um, that would get Glenlock to about capacity. So we still haven't solved for ride. So we still got to come up with a solution there. All these were things that were looked at. And all these were items that were considered in looking at programs or looking at space. But... But to answer your question is, I don't know that there's... I understand, but what, what I'm telling you is that I believe the committee is working within a fixed set of assets. And, yeah. and, and outside of their purview could be a possible solution for this, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't have in your purview as a committee, build a pre-K center. Okay? And I, I mean, I'm just going to throw it out there. Okay? I'm just, I, I didn't say we had the money for it. I didn't say we had the bond money for it. I didn't say we could do it. I didn't say anything, but ask you if it would work for a more permanent solution. I, I didn't think that the committee made the best decision. I, I, I hope I stressed that up front. It, it's not, it's not the, do I disagree with, with, with moving this neighborhood to here. I think they came up with the best decision they could, but it's, at, it's, it's factors outside their purview that could change the, the game. And I'm not saying we should change the game. I don't speak for anybody else here. 
and when you say you're not going to unwrap it in the, you know, turn it upside down in, in two or three years, but you're still contending with neighborhoods that, that one of the major factors here is you're not running them all the way around this, the, the woodlands, and yet you're possibly still going to do it with some of the kids. Well, if it's not good for one, it's not good for any, <coughs> if at all possible. I mean, possible. with all due respect. So it's not the committee's work that I question. It's whether, you know, uh, we're putting the right assets in the right place. I mean, we, we're forced to deal with what we've got, but do we have the capability of changing it? And the last question I have is, do you have to make this decision tonight? It's, it's your decision if we don't no, make I, it tonight. No, I, I know it is. But what will happen to whatever if we don't make this decision tonight? We will hopefully what, have what a decision. What does it affect? Well, it affects, it'll affect staffing. It will affect staffing. Uh, okay. you know, making some decisions about staffing will put us a month back, but we could certainly adjust. Um, and I don't want you to feel tied tied by that. I think our biggest challenge will be we've got to start making some plans about next next school year. If we're going to relocate some programs, if we're going to move folks around, that happens after this decision. And so uh, I would just say we'll just wait till your decision if we don't have one tonight. I appreciate you allowing me to ask questions sure. so that I have a Absolutely. better feel. That, that's Absolutely. really what this amount is being taken. Absolutely. Sorry. Take your time. That's great. Mr. Sanders. All right. Thank you. Uh, and you've already touched on a couple of these, Dr. Hines. A couple of issues that I had written down as best I could. Uh, one, there was a public comment made tonight about not addressing growth along the 1488 corridor. Um, can you kind of publicly state kind of what discussions you had about addressing that similar to what mr husbands is saying i mean we kind of had not a perfect storm because i don't like that phrase but we had a, a failed bond election in may and then we had the legislature that came in and said by the way you go from pre-k half day to full-time pre full day full day pre-k starting this fall which we were not able to do and we had to get a waiver to do because we don't have the space we don't We've got we've got we don't have things in place uh, for that. So we 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 had a failed bond that we didn't get everything we needed for the growth that we anticipated we were going to have that we're now having, and we anticipate even future. Like you said, even with this shift, we're still going to be at 100 percent at almost every school. Um, so if you could just kind of address, I kind of wrote pre-K and 1488 all together. It, 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 it like you were saying, Mr. Husband, it, it's a we we, and, we don't have enough assets to cover. And if I we don't have enough seats to cover, and, and if we had the twenty eight million, we couldn't have a school. The schools by, by August anyway. That's you know that's, it, it well, doesn't matter. It my doesn't matter my third the, comment was about portables. I mean, we're still going to have to address the need for portables, and I know we don't want our pre K and our kinders out in portables. Right. So that means we're going to be pushing fourth graders out in the portables because they're the oldest of the group. But I don't even like that scenario either. But there's no other options because we just don't have chairs. We don't have buildings to do that with. So those those I, I, I'm gonna give you my laundry list, and you can do it however order you want to. So that was uh, pre-K 1488 portables, and the other is just addressing land and building timelines and things. I mean, it takes a year or more, right, to get more. a to get a flex school built. If we were going to build a school, Maybe I assume we would be building a flex school, which would give us the opportunity to either do K now pre-K through four or pre-K through six. So, and we may need to redesign on that if we've got to add classrooms. Randall's just moved out. Is there any way we can? <laughs> I, it, I struggle. You, I struggle. It's not sprinkled. Hey. It's not sprinkled. I'm sorry. You you laugh, but we talked about it. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not laughing. No. I struggle as a board member for the same reason that these families struggle. Mm -hmm. Is it's not a good option. It's not the best option. And I'm not criticizing any work That's right. that was done by the uh, attendance boundary committee. It's hard work. It's not easy. Solomon decides how to split the baby in half. It's not. It's not. It takes a lot of wisdom, and a lot of patience. And I know Dr. Hines, you have all that. Uh, but so, can you can you kind of give us a little bit of information 
just that kind of addresses some of those issues. You may not, and I'm not looking for answers. I'm just looking more for some of the things that will help me feel as good as I can about whatever decision we make as a board. If I can go, so I'm going to go back to a previous community group that we had, our facility planning committee. Okay. So we go back to the bond planning process, um, and all of these numbers were were presented. And if you remember back in that process, the initial need um, that came forward was $1.4 billion because included in that initial conversation was an elementary school on the 1488 corridor. That committee had work to do to, to attempt to bring that number down to what they felt like the community would support and that came to 807. Through that process, they had to prioritize the schools and based on the overall capacities, as you can see what Dr. Hines presented is when this, is, this rezoning uh, scenario was completed, everything would be at 100%. They prioritized places where they were going to be at 120 percent. So there were not funds included in the last bond for an elementary school on the 1488 corridor. So that those funds are not available. Could could that be the first project out of a future bond? Absolutely. And I think that's the answer. You talk about when when would this be addressed or how long would this rezoning? That's when it would be touched. Is when a new school would be built, but there, there aren't funds allocated in the current bond program for a school in that area. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll let Chris get the, the remainder no, of those. But I mean, it, that is our biggest challenge. So we've been looking at sites in that area for the last couple of years and continue to look. Um, it, is a, it is an area that we've identified as a need. Um, but as Dr. No mentioned, it would be... It's not, it's not land, it's money. It, 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 it comes down to money. And it, is it a priority? And we have empty space here, okay? Mm -hmm. And I understand that, uh, but I, I just wish some of the people that would slam me in the face about having 84% capacity and calling it full, okay? Because it's geocoded and it's really not 84, okay? Would come here and listen to this argument about sending kids on a... I don't know how long that bus drives. Okay. Forty-five minutes. I bet. Uh, well, it, it does. I mean, that's how long it takes you and I to get there. I don't know about a yellow bus. Yeah. Okay. On 1488, no less. In the morning when the rest of the traffic's there, I, I do not envy that child. Okay. And the younger, the the, the more the more critical. It, I think it is. I'm not scared to make a decision. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But telling me money's not allocated, I understand it's not allocated. I know what I I know what we passed is a block bond. But don't tell me we can't do it. We can do it, okay? But the question is, can we do it in time? Answered no. no. Now what do we do? Right. I mean, would it be if Jacobs Reserve had to go around the horn for one year while we built a school, that would be different. But that's, again, the money's not there, the land's not bought, plans aren't made, and they're still driving around the horn for a year. Okay, I, I, I don't see that as a realistic solution. Like I said, if I had $28 million to send you right now, and I'm grabbing that number out of the air, but if I had $28 million to hand you right now, I don't think I can solve the problem building a school in the middle of Jacobs Reserve, okay, or anywhere else on 1488. I don't think it can get done and solve this problem. But is there anything that we can do that makes the move not, I, I know you're saying you're not going to flip it back, but it sounds like to me you've got a couple of schools that, you know, just a little bit of a of a change, and it's gonna it's gonna pull the trigger on them again. Lack of better ways. I mean, at 100, percent you're there. I mean, I I know we don't make a move at 100. percent That's perfect, right? But it, you know, and I know it doesn't stay there, especially with new. And that's schools. something to give some consideration to. Um, because in the past, if we've known we're going to go over, and I'll, and I'll use Bush as an example, we know Bush is going to go over, and if we know we're going to split a school, we sometimes have let that school go over intentionally high, and we just we just plan for it, and we deal with it because it makes the split that much easier. And that is certainly going to be an option for us to deal with Bush's growth, and hopefully in a, in a year or two we'll have a better idea. Is that going to be in the near future? If it is, then maybe the answer is we ride it out until we're able to split uh, that way we impact uh, fewer people on the other side. To answer your question, 
we will make whatever work. That's our job right. is to make it work. Um, I would just say the biggest challenge that we're going to face is if we can address, there's roughly 110 students in our bilingual program outside of Lamar, which serves all of its own students at its own program. Majority, the largest majority of those students in that 110 come from Haley, attendance zone. There's roughly 200 students in our, in our pre-K program. So we do have the ability to bus students various distances, not short distances. We could bus up to 300 students away from uh, Lamar and Glenlock towards the west, far west side of the district to provide some relief for Glenlock and Lamar and probably Powell. It won't solve for ride. Now, one option that you have is if you can say we just sit on it. We just sit on being at 132%. Uh, that is certainly an option that we can do. Um, we may go to 133% at some point, um, and we just have to be ready to deal with that. We are at a finite amount of space there. We do not have the ability, in my opinion, to bring in more portables. We've maxed that side out, um, which goes back to... So there's no one single solution. So if we bus everybody in pre-K and we bus everybody in bilingual, we, we will still need to do something for ride. That goes back to uh, we looked at six, five or six different split scenarios where we split Jacob's Reserve in half. Uh, and that certainly becomes an option. We moved out roughly 200 students because that's about what we need to get ride under 600. Um, under 575 is really what we're shooting for. So it would be about a 200 student split and we can move 200 students from Jacob Reserve to another school. And that's certainly an option, and it's something that we did look at. Um, we, we never had great traction with that, but we did look at those. So that is an option as well. It's a short-term um, fix that might buy us some time. Um, you know, but those are options that we can look at, and certainly we'll do – our job is to make it work. But, but I just want to point out that the moving, the moving of bodies, distances – is a part of this and um, what we do achieve with the the Jacobs moving as a whole to Gladys is we have they're driving about the same distance as they are to ride uh, it does impact the same neighborhoods we impacted nine years ago um, does or does not it does, does. Uh, and that's a negative and certainly it's something that was we looked at uh, however um, if you look on that in the map that's a very they're very close to tough at the end of the day, that's not a far drive. Um, and what we gain is then we can start to move people to the center part of the district without having to drive them all the way across the district to, to solve for some of this crowding. So those, those really become our, we have to decide, you know, which one. And, and what I can tell you is that, and again, I won't speak for everybody on the committee, but they understand this is not a pretty option. None of these are pretty options. Nobody's <laughs> feeling proud about it or excited about it. Um, nobody's going home and high-fiving and saying this is really a good thing. Um, really, it's about looking at all the things in front of us with the resources that we had in front of us and then trying to come up with a recommendation that worked and made the most sense to us. Uh, certainly, if we had additional assets, it might have changed the whole discussion and the planning. Um, but we worked with the parameters of the existing buildings we had and the existing space that we had. Uh, so that's you know, that was a limitation, but certainly we we can do whatever you would like us to do, and we're we're able to do it, Mr. Moore. So thank you for uh, addressing that y'all did consider the the split of Jacobs Reserve, um, and you I think your comment was y'all didn't have you never got much traction on that. I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of the committee, but if you could, as the facilitator of those discussions, if maybe you could summarize for me how some of those conversations went. Yeah, I think, I think everybody wrestles with, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, A, their, their, their geographic location, where they are, their distance to travel. Um, there was discussion about the cohort size of splitting them and what that does. So right now, moving that entire neighborhood as a whole basically splits the school. So it makes it a school that splits almost 50%. One of our criticisms we have, Buckaloo is a split elementary, but a very small number split off, and that's been a criticism. And so um, it's all how you look at it. Some people can be critical of the fact that we're moving more than we need, and the other side of it is, is when they do leave and go off, they have a cohort of a substantial size. Given 
given the way Jacobs uh, is a college park feeder neighborhood in pretty much surrounded in the woodlands feeder zone, it also gives some ability at least to keep um, that neighborhood together. And there was a lot of discussion about nobody, you know, why should one neighborhood get preferential treatment over another neighborhood? And certainly, I don't think anybody um, felt like one neighborhood was more important. I think what, what one neighborhood had going for it or going against it is they had a school right down the road. And this one didn't. Um, Isn't it also the size of the neighborhood? I mean, if, if you need 92 kids to move, a neighborhood of 50 doesn't cut it. In, in essence. In essence. Um, but certainly there's no, there's no good answer on that. I mean, no matter what, somebody feels slighted and somebody's going to be upset about it. And I don't, yeah. and that's one of the reasons we, we struggle. I mean, as a committee, we were not unanimous. We were a committee um, that's bringing you a compromise map of what we could get some agreement on, but it wasn't a majority agreement. It's not something that everybody's um, unanimous about. There are a lot of different opinions and a lot of different ideas, and uh, certainly we could have gone many, many different ways. If I could make a comment real quick. Um, can you go back to the slide with the committee member? Sure can. I mean, I would just like to take just a quick second. I know we've had a lot of discussion and there's a lot of motion, but uh, to specifically thank, because, you know, you talk about we're not going to be celebrating or high-fiving, but we, we, lose, we lose track of the fact that we live in an extremely blessed community and we have parents like and, and educators, and staff and principals that you know, when you look at the time that was put in and the investment put in to come up with the best that we possibly do with what what cards we have, I just want to uh, say thank you for serving. Thank you for these tough decisions. And at the end of the day, we are, we are looking at all, all the names of all those elementary schools and those intermediate schools. I mean, we are extremely blessed with what we have. And so I just wanted to say, I know it's been really difficult work and just uh, wanted to, uh, and I, don't, I think all the board is saying the same thing, but we're just extremely thankful for the time that was put into this. Yeah. Let me go back. To yeah, just so um, obviously I think my last count, it was 112 emails that I had received um, about, and, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not denigrating that at all. Please don't hear that. Um, but it, it was a very large number. In fact, it was more, Emails sent directly to me than I received during both of our last two bond campaigns. Um, so this is obviously a very important topic, but that was 112 out of, you know, we had 800 plus public comment either from the website or, you know, submitted to you. Um, of that 112, they were almost exclusively from Gladys parents, a few from Bush parents, and then a few from unaffected but um, um, complimentary um, like-minded folks. Have we heard in that 800 plus comments anything from ride parents who have kids that are at a campus that's at 132%? We have. I, and I ask yeah, because we, that, that group has not reached out yeah, directly we, to me. That's why I asked. We've heard from um, families at uh, Glenlock and we've heard from families at Ride. Certainly there's, there's a group that um, make their wishes known and certainly have communicated to me um, during our meetings and public forums and um, or through emails and phone calls about their their concerns or their feelings and so there's been um, you know there have been comments there's certainly some concerns about um, hey we can't keep going like this at ride you know what are we going to do we got to get we got to get some room um, certainly that we've heard from the concerns about Glenlock and um, we, we did split that bilingual program uh, last year, and that's helped significantly, but in some ways it's just um, shifted some growth issues over to Lamar, and so we've had to, to respond there. Um, but I did want you to know we, do, we have heard some comments from the Glenlock communities, from the Ride communities as well. We heard, I heard quite a bit from the Bush community, particularly about the disruption of um, walking or bike riding mm -hmm. options. Um, we uh, in your packet there was a full uh, there was also there were several um, we received several petitions one from the uh, 
Lake Creek Forest community, um, one from one one from the Gladys community, one from I want to say like might have been through Jacobs Reserve. There were several in there. There were several different. Um, so we heard from a lot of folks. Um, I think we were, uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody's been real happy to be honest with you, that, you know, with the outcome. But uh, we feel like we worked on it pretty. I appreciate that thorough answer because I kind of knew the answer, but I want to be sure that it was stated in the record to understand. Because one of my replies uh, to those that that large number of emails was, we and I was speaking on behalf of myself as a board member, but but we in general want to consider everybody equally in this. That you know there has been the allegations leveled that one community gets preference over another. Um, so I want to make sure that we understand that we are getting input from from a wide range of people here. Um, my last question is, um, or more of a comment, I guess. It's difficult for me to make um, a decision with just this one scenario before us, knowing that that alternative A proposal that, that came in that was emailed, I would like to see this much detail on that. It would help me make a more informed decision. Um, you know, the version that was emailed to us had some of this information in it, but not to the detail that they don't have access to the same level of information that you have. So it's difficult, as has already been said, for me to look at this and think that this is, you know, the least evil thing we can do right now without fully examining what other evils may be out there. Any other comments? Okay, very good. Well, I, my, my, uh, my thoughts are, very similar to what everybody else has already said as well. I, I know this is not easy. Um, of course, the principals don't want to give up their students as well. I'm sure they've been fighting for each one of them. Miss Garrison, <clears throat> Miss Kopeski, and Miss Cresswell is going to love them up. I know she <laughs> is. Um, and I appreciate the uh, the committee, the cross section that you went out and did, because I'm sure after this, those that went through it probably don't want to sign up again to go through this and we do appreciate everything they've done I'm um, so we do have a motion and a second to accept the recommendation are we are we through with um, the discussion are we ready to vote on this on this particular okay very good so um, I call the vote uh, all those in favor of accepting please raise your right hand all against so we have a split three three Okay, so, so it fails. The motion fails. Okay, very good. So we will move on to the to the next item. Um, item B, four B, consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the new elementary school in the Caney Creek feeder zone flex twenty project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. Dr. Noll. All right, Mr. Foster. Good evening, Vice President Hewitt, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It is my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed price amendment for a new elementary school in the Candy Creek Feeder Zone. <clears throat> if you'll recall, back in September, we selected Duratech as our construction manager at risk for a new elementary school in the Candy Creek Feeder Zone. The, the project itself was approved in the, in the November bond election. So since then, we've been working with our architect, IBI Group, and Duratech uh, to put together a guaranteed max price proposal. Based on Duratech proposal for this work, we've negotiated a guaranteed maximum price for the project of $28,053,729. And this time, we're asking for your approval of this amount. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion on this item? Yes. All right. All those. No. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, all those in favor? No, no, no is there is discussion. Oh, excuse me. Yes, there is discussion. <laughs> there is discussion. Thank you. I thought you were kidding about having to throw something out. I'm not kidding. I want to go home too, but. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I have a question, uh, Foster, on these uh, cost savings items, okay, of, of the proposal. I, I know it came in under budget. You go back and you. And I just want to know two things. Number one, is there anything here mission critical? I mean, are we trying to meet a price and giving up 
the you know the ghost or whatever. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Are we accepting something less in Flex 20 than we have in Flex 19 just because the cost of tea has gone up in China? Or, sorry, I didn't mean to bring China into this, but anyway. <laughs> and then last but not least, uh, that's one question. Then number two, um, are these cost savings, I mean, I, I assume Duratec took this out to bid. Are, are these cost savings fixed? I mean, uh, guaranteed or, or however you want to put it. I mean, are they locked in? Can you answer me that, please? Thank I can. You. So, and first of all, to answer the question about kind of any concessions we made. So, a lot of the stuff we looked at uh, are, they're not, they're just differences in opinion, more or less, on the engineering viability of some mechanical systems and mechanical equipment. So we sat down with our maintenance director and maintenance team, our engineering staff, architect staff, and really looked at it with our contractor to make sure when we put a price saving option on the table that it was viable for us, that it wasn't sacrificing quality. So we still want to get a, a building that lasts 50 years. We want systems that last 20, 25 years. We, and we don't feel like we sacrificed any of the quality. We're still getting the long-term equipment, the best uh, of the equipment that we can buy for the money, and we're getting it at, at the price we, we negotiated. So, to answer the second part of your question, are these savings locked in? So, I can tell you, we do have a budget target, and we're always concerned about our budget. Sure. So, for the purposes of this meeting and, and, and time frames, because we've talked about some of the events of the recent past that have pushed us to where we are today, we approved the CM before we had a November bond election, because we knew we, we were kind of backed up in a corner from the timeline. So, as soon as we had a bond referendum that was successful, we started the wheels rolling to make that, make that selection bear fruit. So we've been working with that CM all, all along the way to make sure we hit the market, we advertised adequately, we got good responses. We had 298 bid responses from the trade community. So we feel like we got good coverage in that regard. But what we've done is we, we came in on bid day higher than our target. And we've been working with them over the last couple of weeks to get down to the target. Now we've locked in what we've got right here on paper. But the good news is, is with our delivery method and our construction manager working on our, to our benefit, we're going to continue working on that. There's some, there's some low, not necessarily low, complex, low hanging fruit that's still out there that we will be able to get because we're using a construction manager to our benefit. So rather than the construction manager cutting a corner, putting his money in the pocket, we're able to realize those savings. So what we've got is, is locked in, but I think there's a little bit more to be had. Okay. I'm ready. Anything else? Anyone else? All right, I'll call the vote now. All those in favor, get right in. Good. Motion carries. All right, um, we're on to C, consider and approve the select selection of the construction manager at risk, the safety and security 2020 project, and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the construction management at risk contract. Dr. Foster. So again, uh, based on a project that was approved in the 2019 bond referendum, we bring forward for your consideration and approval uh, CM selection, that's a construction manager at risk selection for our safety and security project. <laughs> it's labeled here 2020 because that happens to be the year end, but it is to cover all five years of our bond referendum's life. So this will be 2020 through 2024 for work that we plan on doing with that group. So since the bond election, we worked with our architect, which is PBK, uh, they helped us you know, craft the RFQ, our purchasing department published that RFQ, and then we had three companies respond to the RFQ. Um, since we had three, we invited three to participate in step two. Step two is where we get fees and percentages for their pre-construction services, all the other kind of money consideration items in the selection process. So following that, uh, following the review of the fees and on the qualifications, we're recommending Ellisor constructors be selected as the offeror who we feel submitted the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. We've also made the ranking criteria of, of all of the selectors, all the contractors that responded as part of the item as well. But this time we're re requesting your approval of LSOR constructors as our CM at risk. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, seeing none. You have a question? Nope. All those in I don't want to mess it up this time, John. All right. All those in favor of right, right hand? Trying to confuse you. Very good. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, 4D, consider and approve the selection of construction management at risk for 
the campus renovation 2020 project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute construction management at risk contract. Dr. Noll. So again, arising out of our 2019 bond referendum, this is our campus renovation project for 2020, and this will be specific to the 2020 uh, area of work that we're, that we're working on. And like our last uh, item, uh, we worked with our architect. The architect for this package is the DLR group. They helped us craft our RFQ, and then our purchasing department published that. And in that, we had five companies respond to this request for qualifications. Now, the, the law will allow us to shortlist for step two up to five. In this case, we elected to uh, shortlist three companies. So those three companies that participated in step two submitted their pricing uh, along with their qualifications. Following that review of the pricing and the qualifications, we recommend GTT general contractors to be selected as the offeror submits the best the, the proposal we determine to be the best value for the district. And just like our other items, the ranking evaluation of all the contractors uh, is included as an item as well. So this time we're requesting your approval of GTT as our construction manager for campus I'll renovations move approval. 2020. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Three. Motion passes. Thank you. E, consider and approve the section of construction manager at risk for the new junior high school at Caney Creek Feeder Project and the North and East Transportation Center Project and the Caney Creek High School Upgrade Project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the construction manager at risk. Dr. Noll. All right, this time I'd request or uh, bring forward for your consideration and approval uh, uh, contract or seam at risk for a long project name. So that's a new junior high school in the Caney Creek Feeder Zone. The capacity and program upgrades for Caney Creek High School, uh, they're in very close proximity to the new junior high. The East County Transportation Project, which is also in very close proximity to those two buildings. And because of similarity in the project, the North County Transportation as well. So it's all one package, so we'll do it in, we'll actually bring you multiple GMPs across each of those projects over, over the life of this particular selection. But again, it was born out of our 2019 bond referendum. PBK is our architect and they helped us our purchasing department uh, published our RFQ. We did have seven companies respond to the RFQ, and like the uh, couple items before, we selected three to participate in our uh, second step of our two-step selection process. And we're recommending Joris General Contractors be selected as the offeror who submits the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. We've also attached the grading criteria and the, the rankings of all the other respondents as well as part of the item. At this time, we're requesting your approval of Joris as this construction manager at risk. I move approval. I, I've got a, uh, a, word? a second. All second. I got a recuse. So we have a, wait, excuse me one second. We have a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second. Okay. All right. We'll call that at the, uh, at the vote. All right. Is there any other discussion? We have a motion and a second. Yeah, I have some. Yes, sir. You will go. Okay. So, Mr. Frost, first I wanted to applaud you for combining these projects. I know they're close in proximity, but we could have spent more money and separated each one of them out and had a CM at risk for each of those projects. And I applaud you for combining those. I think that's a good use of trying to reduce our costs. And I agree, I think with they're all within a mile of each other. This is really one project with many different parts to it. And I just, I really, it was more of a comment than a question, but I really want to say thank you for thinking about our district's money and making good use of that, because I think this is a great project to do in this case, because it looks odd on its face when you start talking about we're doing part of this to the high school and building new junior high, and at, but it makes sense when they're, we know they're all right there together. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just want to say thank you. Mr. Husbands. Mr. Foster. Um, Size of this contract, 180 million somewhere. Well, the, no, 160, the, 180 million. The somewhere total there. total construction value value is right around 85 million dollars. 85 million. Yes, okay. All right. Uh, sorry that I was only 100 off. I, I, <laughs> I must have got it confused with something else. But anyway, my question comes in this: uh, We, for a long time, including in this bid rep, uh, had uh, a number of of uh, of of GCs that do regular work for us. And I don't, I, well, I know exactly who they are being in my business, but I'm unfamiliar with their history here. And I'm unfamiliar with, um, 
what I'm saying is we've introduced new GCs to that, our organization before. Balfour Betty comes to mind, okay? And their first project was about a $15 million roof, if I remember correctly. Something in that neighborhood anyway. It wasn't 85, million, whatever. And my concern is, you know, in my business, when you go to insure somebody and, and they've been doing work here and they want to build a school in Austin, the insurance company is going to have red flags go off everywhere, okay? And I'm very familiar with who they are. Are they capable of building a school? Without a doubt. But they build them in San Antonio. And I want to make it perfectly clear that I'm expecting them to be able to build one in Conroe. I'm not voting against it. I want to make it clear. But, <laughs> I, I mean, $85 million project's a big start. Okay, a big start. Balfour Betty can chew them up and spit them out, even though they're real big in San Antonio. Okay, so I want to make it clear that, you know, I don't know these people. I mean, I don't know their capability of building it here. And what I'm talking about is they don't build it, the subs build it. But if they have a sub problem like we've had in the past on one or two of our projects and they don't have somebody to fall back on, you know how that gets <laughs> twisted yes, out. So I'm, I'm throwing that up as a general question. What do you got for me? Okay. Well, and, and thanks for asking. We, we do have, uh, and the committee thought about it long and hard. So the good news is, is we, this is not the first time we've seen George participate in one of our procurements. So we yeah. recently selected them to be one of our jock contractors on our much, much smaller uh, scale of work. So they're a big old giant company who wants to come in and do whatever we'll be willing to give them. So the, the long and short of this particular selection is they are qualified. We haven't found anything on their, on their, uh, from their references that would say they, there's a reason not to hire them. They do bring a team to us that I'm personally familiar with, the superintendent they're going to assign to the job, having worked directly side by side with that man in the past. So he's a Houston native and worked in the Houston markets. Their project manager they're assigned to the job is one that another uh, gentleman, Mr. Phillips, in our department actually trained uh, side by side with him. I mean, so they're not bringing foreign entities to us, which is a good thing in our in our book. Uh, they are working in Houston, so we're not their first uh, school project in the area, so that's a good thing. Uh, well, but yet they're working, but they haven't completed, right? I right. mean, they I, are I, new yeah. to the Houston area. Correct. They, okay. I'm, I'm not office. wrong about that, Emma. No, their Houston okay. office is approximately three years old, uh, so they did come with other clients, and in my opinion, they've, they've been growing uh, organically, so not storing at it so I think they're I think they put a plane together that fits Conroe ISD uh, on top of that they had a, a very enticing price I mean so their fees uh, were hard to look away from I mean so at this time I mean our, our this is one one case where I can say our, our committee was unanimous I mean through lots of discussion like the heartache, and it's very rarely that our community is unanimous across the board so this is one that we feel comfortable about and are willing to stand behind I hope so sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Hearing no other comments, uh, we'll go ahead and vote all those in favor. Okay. Uh, all those against? And any abstentions? Any to abstain. Very good. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, item F, consider and approve the, sec the selection of construction manager at risk for the Woodlands College Park High School Classroom Addition Project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the con construction manager at risk contract. So at the risk of repeating myself, uh, we are pleased to bring forward for your consideration and approval a selection of a construction manager at risk for our College Park High School classroom additions project. Again, born out of our 2019 bond referendum. Uh, architect here is PBK, and again, they helped us uh, prepare an RFQ. Uh, our purchasing department published that for us. We had 10 companies respond to our request for qualifications. Uh, in accordance with state law, we allowed five to participate in step two. Out of those five, we got pricing, we reviewed that, and we're recommending Marshall Construction be selected as the offeror submits the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. And like the other ones, we've put our ranking evaluation as part of the item as well. So at this time, we're requesting your approval as, of Marshall Construction as <coughs> our construction manager at risk. We have a motion. Second. Second. We have a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Very good. Motion passes. Almost feels like we have a growing district here. All right. 
Consider and approve a G. Consider and approve the section selection of construction manager at risk for the Woodlands High School Specialty Classroom Additional Project, Addition Project, and the Conroe High School Ninth Grade Classroom Addition Project, and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute and ex execute the construction manager at risk contract. Mr. Foster. Again, uh, thank you for we're bringing forward your consideration and approval. Another bundled project, so we've got uh, commonality in our. Uh, uh, architecture staff for this particular uh, selection. So the the additions at the Woodlands High School, which is a specialty classroom addition, and then the Conroe High School ninth grade, which is a classroom addition. Uh, we worked with the IBI group uh, to help develop the RFQ for this particular project. Our purchasing department published it, and we had six companies respond uh, to our request for qualifications. Out of those six, we invited four to participate in step two of our two-step selection process. After reviewing their pricing and their qualifications, we're recommending Ellisor constructors be selected as the offeror who submits the proposal determined to be the best value for the district. And like the others before it, the ranking evaluation is attached as part of the item as well. So at this time, we're requesting your approval of Ellisor constructors as our senior at risk. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Very good. Thank you. Mr. Foster, that's a lot of work you put in there. I'm sure you probably kissed your wife goodbye in December and said, I'll see you in the summer sometime. Five years from now. We'll, we'll be back next yeah, month. Yeah. Uh, H. Okay. I'm moving on to H, receive capital improvement update. Thank you. Well, here's the, the good news. I'm moving on to tell you what's good going on throughout the district as far as capital improvements are concerned. Uh, bad news is this is the shortest one we'll see for several months in the, in the future. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you about Stockton Junior High School. Uh, Stockton Junior High is scheduled to open in August of 2020. So it will come uh, when our, we break for the summer. When the kids come back, they're going to go to school at Stockton Junior High School. So you can see from the uh, overhead picture now the, what we've been talking about, getting the building to a dry state uh, over the last couple of months. It is essentially in a dry state now. So the roof is 90% complete. The windows are about 90% complete. And over the next week or so, we will actually fire up the air conditioning system and bring the building under climate control. So the front door is not in yet. So if you walked in the building, you'll see some areas that are cordoned off to help protect our, our utility cost interest. Uh, so not only not air conditioning the whole neighborhood, so to speak, but air conditioning portions of the building. Uh, so one of those critical path items coming up is the gym floor. So as we were bringing the building under condition, we'll deliver the gym floor materials. And over the next couple of months, you'll see that go in. But you can see the painting, the the life of the building is beginning to come together. And on the inside uh, classrooms, we're looking at the inside of one of the art classrooms, you'll notice the ceiling grid, light fixtures, casework, things of that nature. So uh, with the air conditioning coming online now, we're controlling the humidity and we're installing everything that soaks up moisture now that we can control how much moisture is in the building. Uh, so that is, I'm happy to report on schedule. Uh, and we're scheduled to open in August of 2020, like I said, and that is our update. All right. Well, I hope those that. pictures of the basketball arena are more maroon than red because well, Dr. Uh, Stockton might have a little. It is maroon. It, it is it, indeed it is maroon. maroon. Yes. All right. Yes. Just, just check it. It is indeed. Other ones? Indeed. No, I've had a request to move item 7, human resources A and B, up. If nobody has any problems with that, I'd like to move that up if you don't mind. Very good. Uh, Dr. Noll, we have the item 7A. Name Executive Director of School Improvement and Leadership Trans. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. Transformation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as we continue to work on our schools and, and find ways to make sure that all of our schools are, are successful, one of our uh, newest endeavors for next year will be a department focused on school improvement to help our schools that are, um, you know, needing to work on specific areas and, and the state has mandated that we that we do that that we target these campuses and uh, as we have looked for an executive director to lead um, the charge uh, the the choice has been somewhat obvious to us I, I will tell you um, over many years as a principal we saw that dr. Tamika Taylor um, led Travis intermediate through a challenging time to become one of our highest performing schools um, from there, she moved into a, a leadership position in the district, working with our assessment and working with school improvement over the last few years. And she has made herself an expert, uh, not only in the accountability system, but an expert in 
what makes schools function well and what makes for successful schools. Um, she's proven, as we've seen with her work to assist Sam Houston Elementary, that she can go in and help campuses to grow uh, and become successful on their own. And so tonight, uh, it's my honor to recommend Dr. Tamika Taylor for the Executive Director of School Improvement. So moved. Second the motion. motion. Second. Any conversation? Any discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Right hand. All opposed? Very good. Motion passes. Vice President Hebert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, this is an honor that I gratefully and respectfully accept. I would like to sincerely thank the members of the board for investing in our future through the addition of the Executive Director of School Improvement and Transformation position. Your unwavering support for improving schools and supporting the district's goal of increase, increasing student outcomes for all students is what makes this district a great place to work. Former CEO of General Electric, Jack Welch, quotes, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is about growing others. Throughout my tenure as a leader in this district, I have been blessed to learn and grow under the guidance of Dr. Chris Hines, Dr. Curtis Knoll, and for that, I am eternally grateful. I look forward to continued growth <laughs> and opportunity. I repeat my gratitude to all who made it possible for me to be standing in front of you tonight, embracing this new journey, and that list is incredibly endless. <laughs> my biological family could not be here tonight, but I am blessed to be surrounded by my close friends and family, my adopted family and love, the Fleming family and Brown family that are here tonight. Please stand. <laughs> Karen Fuller, please stand. My TAC family, who is here tonight, please stand. I am wholeheartedly committed to the great responsibility that this position holds, and I look forward to continuing CISD's mission to achieve the best for all students. Thank awesome. you. So much and Mr. Hubert, if I if I may, before we uh, go to B, it's a, it's a little unprecedented, but sure. but uh, as as part of this department of school leadership and transformation, we are going to have two directors in this area as well, and we've actually already made a move. It was a um, a move that I made administratively to move uh, a principal into that role, but. I wanted to take an opportunity tonight to celebrate him. And although I won't be asking you all to vote on that tonight, I did want to celebrate him tonight and give him an opportunity to address you um, as we normally would. And so as we begin to work uh, on this department and think about a director, um, you look to your best principles. Who, who makes a difference every day? And Hartwell Brown is a principal who is a family legacy in Conroe ISD, a long and proud tradition uh, in Conroe ISD. Um, and he has been so successful at what would be considered our mo most at-risk junior high, um, but what it also is, is our most decorated campus in Conroe ISD, receiving more distinctions than any other campus in Conroe ISD. And you don't get that without great leadership. So when we look for a principal that can go in and help other principals um, climb that mountain and help people believe that all students can and will be successful. It was obvious to me and it was my honor um, to make that move to, to name Hartwell Brown a director of school improvement. So if I may, I'd love to invite him up uh, today. Yeah. 
to Vice President Hubert, members of the school board, and Dr. Null. It is a great honor to have been named Director of School Improvement and Leadership Transformation. I am so honored, and I just wish my dad could have been here tonight to see that. My mom is working at track meet across the street, so she couldn't be here. <laughs> so she's been doing this over 50 years, and she's been a big mentor to me, and I really wish she could have been here tonight, but she had to be with the kids as we dedicated to making sure they're successful. Um, along this road for 20 years, exactly 20 years ago at this time, I was named principal of Berkeley T. Washington Junior High School. And I made a commitment at that time to be dedicated to success. And I stand before you today saying that we were a very successful campus. It didn't come easy. It was a lot of tears, sweat, and hard work, but I persevered through it. And with the great mentors I've had along the way, Dr. Stockton, Dr. Noel, Dr. Hines, Dr. Sharples, Ms. Galatis and Mr. Coshin, I've accomplished some great things in Washington and I'm proud of that and looking forward to this new endeavor. I can't thank you enough for putting your trust in me to give me this opportunity. So when I started Washington, my, my school motto was work together and pull together. And that's how I see myself going into this team, working together and pulling together for the success of all principals to make CISD the greatest place to be. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Nolan. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you for allowing us to do that. <laughs> you betcha. All right, uh, we would like to move on to item 7B, the name of principal of Stockton Junior High. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, so with uh, Mr. Brown's uh, promotion into his new role, it left a vacancy for what will be Stockton Junior High next yes. year. Um, certainly big shoes to fill and, and uh, uh, a tough task for us. As the committee considered who might be the best recommendation to you, um, one of the things that we kept circling back to in conversation was who has the ability to mesh the cultures of Washington Junior High and Pete Junior High together to create a successful academic environment. That, that's really the task at Stockton Junior High as we've uh, seen with those new boundary lines. Um, that choice became crystal clear. Um, a leader that has been doing that for the last five years is the principal at Conroe High School ninth grade campus has been accepting students from Woodland, from Washington High School, Junior High School, and Pete Junior High School, and creating a very successful culture. Um, Brian Gorka brings a ton of energy to work every day. Um, he's a positive leader. He understands the culture of our two junior highs, and he understands what students need in high school to be successful. So I'm proud tonight to recommend Mr. Brian Gorka to be the principal of Stockton Junior High School. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any conversation? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Well, I'm going to ask any opposed. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, I spent today on uh, wrote road, the whole thing, and I thought, hey, okay, I'm going to go up and I'm going to read it. And my, my, some of my staff's here, and they said, Gorka, you're not going to read that thing. You start talking. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, Vice President Hubert, board members, Dr. Noll, thank you for this opportunity. It's a blessing to my family. You probably heard that little voice yelling in the outside. That was yeah. That's awesome. Uh, it reminded me of some principal I know. <laughs> <laughs> he has the energy. That's exactly right. But it's a, it's a blessing to, to work in Conroe ISD and, and, uh, before I go into this opportunity, Hartwell Brown. Uh, Hartwell Brown, the man, what he's done for Connor ISD and what he has done at Washington Junior High is amazing. And the kids, I, I get to talk to these kids in the past five years that have gone through Washington and, and hear the passion they have for that man and what they, he has done and established there. He's created a culture of learning. You know, he, he, he helps the kids understand you have to have desire and heart. You have to work hard. You have to strive to excel. And you you got to do the little things right every day. By doing the little things right every day, great things happen for you. 
You know, uh, last weekend, uh, Ty Tolbert talked about uh, the things his parents talked to him on that stage right there in Washington. He talked about uh, work hard. If you work hard enough and long enough, great things will happen for you. And that's what you got to focus on. Focus on what's in front of you. Work hard every day. And, and uh, for 20 years, Hartwell Brown did it. He and those kids know he loved them. Those teachers know he loved them. I am blessed to be able to, to go into that building and learn and work with uh, his staff. And I'm going to get to learn and work with him because he's going to be right there beside us as a director. So it is a blessing. It's an opportunity uh, that, oh my gosh, it, I'm excited about. And I appreciate that opportunity uh, that you are providing me. I have to say thank you to my my, my parents. You know, uh, the first time five years ago when I shared, they're not here with us. My mom has passed, and uh, not twelve years ago. Both educators. I grew up an educator's kid. I ran the hallways. I was the one loud in, in, in the hall and running the building, and uh, just always knew I wanted to, to have that same thing that my parents gave me. You know, being raised by educators. My wife came into this building, uh, or into this district in 2006. Uh, Chris McCord hired her, and our conversations and back and forth of the district and, and opportunities that this district had. Always, always, it happened to be at the start of school here, this, these stories about this guy, Dr. Stockton. You know, he would tell these wonderful stories, and she would, to me, when that she got back, because at that time I was in another district, but I, I as soon as I could make the jump, I did, and I've been blessed ever since. Uh, and it's an amazing opportunity to now to go work in that building that uh, is named after Dr. Stockton. And uh, you know, I'm excited about that opportunity. I also, I want the staff at Conroe 9, we talk about family, my family, our family. We have a school family, and when you have a school family, those people, you, you see them more than your own family. You're with them every day, and you're doing things to make a difference in the lives of the children we serve. It's been an honor and privilege to be their principal, you know, and, and to work with the, the, the community of Conroe and the, the parents and, and the staff members. Uh, I, I look forward to continuing serving the same community and, and doing amazing things and continuing the traditions that Harbor Brown established there at Washington and carrying them forward to Stockton. Uh, we will do great things. We will continue. You know, I love sitting by Hartwell in those attendance boundary meetings. He was excited about the those those changes, and he's going to still approve those, just have those distinctions, no matter what took place. And our goal and aspiration is to do the exact same thing. So Hartwell, I'm working for you, and I will work for you. I'm working for all the students and staff from Washington and P, and we're bringing it together, and we're going to do amazing things at Stockton Junior High School. I look forward to establishing those new traditions and, and having kids excited about being in school because that's what it's about. The kids come to us and they have a natural passion to learn. That little man right there wants to learn and he's excited about learning new things and, and he wants to be successful. And we have to make sure we create buildings and schools and classrooms that allow every kid to, to never lose that passion, to always have it and strive for it and, and see their future and see the opportunities they have before them and help them always believe and always dream and always strive for more. So thank you for this opportunity. It is a blessing, like I said before, and I look forward to serving as the principal of Stockton Junior High School. Thank you. Very good. Little man needs to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, got to rope him down in that bed. Sean, you want to stay for one equipment? All right, very good. Congratulations to all those and all those families as well. Uh, going back up to item five, uh, A, consider award of RFP 19-11-02. Wayne Equipment Upgrade, E-Rate, Dr. Noel. All right, Mr. Rick Reeves. Mm -hmm. Gotta follow him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Mm -hmm. Vice President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noel. Tonight we're recommending that the Board of Trustees consider awarding RFP number 1911-02, the Wide Area Network Equipment Upgrade, E-Rate to Datavox for an estimated expenditure of 405000 
Request for proposals pertaining to the acquisition of internet access and telecommunication services and installation of wide area network equipment for three CISD campuses. McCullough, Oak Ridge High School and the Wilderness High School were distributed to potential service providers through the USAC e-file system and advertised two times in the courier. The district received multiple responses. Pricing for this project should be effective through June 30th, 2021, and under E-rate guidelines, work may begin April 1st, 2020. These proposals were evaluated by members of the technology department and reviewed by the purchasing department. Best value offers are recommended for board approval and funding will be provided in the capital projects fund. At this time, we recommend your approval. Okay. I move approval. We have a motion and a second. Any conversation? I have a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Riggs, I just wanted to understand, and I couldn't tell from the board book, is this a replacement of existing equipment or is this upgrading our equipment to do something different? This is the upgrade of equipment. For okay. To up, upgrade. Well, you know, I buy a new car and it's an upgrade, right? right? You know, just because it's new. I could probably so I'm get trying, Mr. Lawrence from technology. I, I'm not technology savvy either. So I really just want to understand <laughs> what we're buying. Yes, I understand wide area network. Yes, sir and how it works. Terry, you probably can answer the question. Is yeah, i just that, trying to understand what the your purpose. What equipment at these campuses, uh, switches and uh, Wi-Fi access points and things in the background? Yes. To make the network run. To make it run better yeah. or, uh, uh, that's what I'm trying, uh, is this just a, repla just a replacement yeah. well, or are we improving the what we're gonna be able to do? That's, that's, okay, that's that's was that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. His life cycle. Okay. So basically so life it's kind of like network. technology upgrades itself. So we're replacing it, but in the replacement, we're getting better service and quality. Is that fair? We're getting newer equipment. Newer equipment, right? We're also using E-rate to leverage our funds to get money back from USAC. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. All right. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Moving to item B, consider award of CSP 19-11-03 Campus Network Equipment Refresh E-Rate. Mr. Street. Once again, we're recommending that the Board of Trustees consider approval of CSP 19-11-03 Campus Network Re Equipment Refresh, this is E-Rate as well, to Datavox for an estimated expenditure of $2,750,000. Uh, the notification of proposal pertaining to the purchase of these internal connections for the 13 campus technology refresh project were distributed to potential service providers through the USAC e-file system and also advertised two times in the courier. Um, two vendors submitted four qualifying bid responses on this one. Pricing for this project shall remain effective through June 30th, 2021 and under E-rate guidelines, the work will begin April 1st, 2020. These proposals were also evaluated by members of technology and reviewed by the purchasing department. Best value offers are recommended for board approval and funding be provided for in the capital capital projects fund. At this time, we recommend your approval. And I guess basically the same question. This, these are your switches yeah. and it, yes. first. Need a motion. A second. I'll, I'll move to approve. Well, we have a motion. Have we could break the rules. Okay, <laughs> second. All right, but anyway, so the, this the question is simply this: Are these campuses getting something that? these these nine will only have or are they just getting upgrades from well, what everybody's got and it just timed up these are the, th it's the same thing same thing this yes, that's sir, this close enough for me good all right <laughs> let's go <laughs> well done okay any other questions okay uh, all those in favor any up against very good motion carries thank you very much and then item C, receive financial reports. All right, Ms. Karen Garson. <laughs> Vice President Hubert, members of the board, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Null, it is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements as of January 31st, 2020. First statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet. The balance sheet shows the district's assets, liabilities, and fund balance for the general fund the Debt Service Fund, Child Nutrition Fund, and Self-Funded Insurance. Taking a closer look at the largest asset on our balance sheet, cash and investments, cash on hand in the general fund, $14,100, bank deposits, $1.9 million, investments in the state pools of $237.6 million, our short-term investments, $14.8 million, our investments with Wood Forest National Bank, $76 million, and our longer term investments with TCG 51.7 million for total cash and investments in the general fund 
of $382.2 million. Tax collection progress, we, uh, tax collections are coming in very nicely. We are currently at 89.61% of our budgeted levy of $468.5 million. Currently trending almost 2% above where we were at this time last year, so we're very pleased with how tax collections are coming in. Next statement we'll look at is the income statement. The income statement shows the district's revenues and expenditures. Our revenues come from three major sources, local and intermediate, state revenue, and federal program revenue. Looking at expenditures by major object in the general fund, of course, payroll is our largest expenditure. In child nutrition supplies and in self-funded insurance claims processing, we did make our first debt payment on Friday um, in the amount of $73 million, so you will see that reflected in the debt service expenditures next month on the income statement. Taking a closer look at local revenue, as we discussed, uh, the largest generator of revenue in the general fund and debt service fund is our tax collections. In child nutrition, it's food sales and in self-funded insurance premium contributions. Our projected fund balance, um, we're projecting at the end of 831.20 a, a surplus in the general fund of $9.5 million. As you'll recall, $6 million of that was a budgeted surplus in the 1920 budget. The additional three and a half was generated by state revenue for the additional 650 students over our 1350 budgeted growth. Um, so we are projecting a $9.5 million surplus in the general fund at this point. Self-funded insurance, total revenue for the year, $20.4 million, total expense of 20.3. The plan has experienced several very large high dollar claims over the last few months, and you can see how it has taken its toll on the plan. Um, participation at our wellness centers continues to be strong, averaging 578 year to date. Ms. Garza, can I ask a question while sure. we're there? So of these high dollar claims, are these kind of one-offs, or are you seeing something different in the claims that's causing these? Yeah, the majority of these are one-offs. There, we've had we've had some very sick employees and their spouses. We've also had a couple of preemies that come out, and really preemies drive up those costs a lot. Right. But we have had a run of high-dollar claims lately that are that are primarily uh, heart-related, cancer-related, okay. and then the preemies also. Okay. All right. Our December and January tend to be high claims months anyway because of no. the holiday. Well, actually, 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 December and January kind of boost us a little bit. So, so you mm -hmm. know, these two months being in the negative or you know a little concerning. If you remember the last few months, we talked about right. hey, we have some high claims, and I've already seen in February we've already got notices of additional high claims that are coming in. So okay. they're trying. So. So the trend, you know, it's just one of those trends where, the, the, you know, we just have a bad cycle of some, of some high dollar claims coming in, and we're just hoping that tapers off the rest of, you know, at least the rest of the spring, because we know summer's going to be high. Right. So do we anticipate right now needing to make any kind of a budget adjustment? Not right now at this time. Okay. I, I think we get into March, April, we might take a look at it and see if okay. we need to, to make some adjustments at that time. On that same note, on the, on the dovetail into that, I know we made some um, some plan changes as well. Mm -hmm. Are these plan changes? Is this an effect of any plan changes at all that you can tell? Well, no, no sir. I think In other words, I, would they would it have been less if I, we I had think, this? I think I think plan changes. These are actually as I don't want to, I don't know how to how to actually say it. Although it's a bad result, mm -hmm. our Could results would have been worse had we been on the other plan. Okay, because our because our, our our contracts through United are, are stronger than they were with Aetna. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And lastly, looking at our investments, as of January 31st, um, par value $583.3 million. Our pools are yielding 1.847. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank yielding 1.76. Our short-term investments yielding 1.811 with a WAM of 187 days. Our longer-term investments with TCG yielding 2% with a WAM of 451 days, and our overall combined portfolio yielding 1.849 with a WAM of 43 days, and then our benchmark, the 90-day T-bill, is yielding 1.523. Another question. Um, on our collections for property tax collections, usually we can see, in the past, we've been able to compare year to year. Are we on track for Last year to this yes, year, yeah, we're, we're up. Did I miss that? Two percent. This slide right here. Yeah. We're almost two percent above where we were last we year. Go. This time. Okay, great. Thank you. 
right. That's it. Right, thank you very much. All right. Uh, Dr. Noll, I guess. Yes. Session. I'll take it from here. Thank you. This meeting of the Conroe ISD Board of Trustees is convened on February 18th, 2020. The quorum of the board is present, including the following members, Mr. Moore, Mr. Husbands, Mr. Kidd, Mr. Hubert, Mr. Sanders, and Mr. Inman. The board will hear the appeal of two complaints filed by former CISD employee Lisa Marie Perkins Williams in accordance with local board policy DGBA. The hearing is being recorded. Mrs. Perkins Williams complaints are against several employees in the district's transportation department. Because the complaints are against district employees, the hearing will be held in closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074 and 552.082. The board will also go into executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071 for consultation with the board's attorney. The meeting is now adjourned to executive session under Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 551.074, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 551.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.082, 552.